So, when I was 18 years old, I had just gotten interested in topics around body, mind, spirit, health, and states of consciousness, and meditation. I was a freshman at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and I heard that a man was coming to town who was a renowned consciousness researcher and meditation teacher. And I thought to myself, i got to be at that lecture. So I showed up on a Thursday evening, and there were about 200 people in the audience. And one of the things I remember him saying that day was he sort of challenged the, the audience. And he said, every one of you in this room is a very conditioned, predictable person. Probably more than you would ever realize that you live your life on automatic pilot. And it may very well be that you only have one choice every day. And then he challenged the audience, what do you think that one thing is? And somebody in the back of the room raised his hand and said, whether to get up in the morning or not. And everybody laughed, no, no, that's not it. And people made other guesses. And finally the speaker gave his answer. And his answer was, whether you're going to meditate today or not. Now, as a young, kind of idealistic 18-year-old, I was really annoyed to hear this. Because I was sure I had a lot of free will. And I make lots of choices every day. And the notion that my life is conditioned and predictable and habitual to that extreme just didn't sit very well with me. Now, over the years, I have come to appreciate more and more his statement. But I've also broadened my own understanding of what he meant by meditation. Because I think it's more than just sitting in a chair for five minutes or ten minutes or twenty minutes and trying to keep the mind focused on something. There's certainly a place for that kind of meditative practice and we'll be looking at some of the research around that kind of meditation, and even this afternoon practice a couple of different meditation-like exercises that you could take home with you. But it occurs to me over the years that meditation is something we have opportunities to do throughout the day without even closing our eyes. We can become meditative in our response to life, or as it's more often called, mindful. Anytime we make the choice to step back from our conditioned, habitual, especially emotional reaction to life, we've had a miniature little meditation experience. We've had a moment of mindfulness in which we begin to break a lot of the routines that drive our psychology and even influence very deeply our health. So I walked out of that evening presentation back there in 1968 in Houston, and I was inspired to become a meditator even though I was a little annoyed about the notion of being that predictable creature. But where is a college freshman going to find a place to meditate? I mean, I'm living in the dorm there on campus. That's not a place to try to find quiet. And the only place I could find to meditate was there in Fondren Library on the Rice campus, and I would go up and find a little study carol on the top floor as far back in the corner as I could find. And I began to experiment a little bit with trying to have periods of breathing and one-pointedness. And actually what happened for me were some beginner's luck, early experiences that showed me something goes on, that something can happen in my body, something can happen in terms of the clarity of my mind from beginning to practice meditation. Now, as the years have gone by, I've gone through lots of peaks and valleys with my meditation practice. And I would guess that any of you who have been meditators would, would agree, you know, there's some months that you're doing well with it, and other months really hard to meditate. It's a matter of hanging in there and staying with the discipline. But at age 59, I think I have a relatively high level of wellness in my life, and I attribute most of that, actually, to the practice of meditation over the years. Now, what do we mean by the word wellness? For those of you that were here for the panel earlier this afternoon, there were some very interesting statements about health and wellness. And let me recapitulate some of the ways we might think about wellness. And these are ways that fit in nicely to our uh, exploration of mindfulness and meditation. Wellness is a state that combines health and happiness. And happiness is a word that's been made popular, especially with uh, positive psychology in the last 10 years. Another definition, wellness is a healthy balance of body, mind, and spirit that results in an overall feeling of well-being. Another definition, wellness is an active process of becoming aware of and making choices towards a more successful existence. 
featuring both awareness and then making healthy choices. Another one, wellness is the constant and conscious pursuit of living life to its fullest potential. You can see we're getting a lot of different nuances here about wellness. And one more, wellness is a state of health and well-being that is more than merely disease-free. We heard that from several panelists in the last hour, didn't we? But there's something about health and wellness that has to be more than just the absence of pains and aches and symptoms of disease. Wellness is trying to expand us to the full potential of what it means to be a human being. And my experience is that meditation can be a powerful tool to take us in that direction. Now we could spend um, all afternoon just exploring different definitions of mindfulness and meditation. And my graduate assistant Mike's coming around. If you don't have the handout yet, maybe raise your hand and he can pass one down to you. We'll be using that in just a little bit. But here's the definition of mindfulness that is used at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center with Dr. John Kabat-Zinn and his uh, Mindfulness Center. It's really an elegant definition. I imagine a lot of people got in a room and worked hard to get it down into a small number of words. It says mindfulness means paying attention. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Okay, that's almost mantric in itself, isn't it? That's really the distillation of a lot into just a few words. Mindful ne mindfulness needs paying attention, directing your attention, being aware and awake enough that you realize you have a choice of the quality of how you pay attention, and that you can do it with purpose. Okay, those of you in my course, you know, purpose is one of the words in the title of the course, in the present moment, because our minds so quickly drift into an imagined future or a remembered past, it's really hard to stay in the present moment and in a non-judgmental way. Again, those of you who were in my class remember that last week we looked at a fabulous video that any of you can watch on the TED.com website of Jill Bolte Taylor, who's a neuroanatomist who had a stroke and understood what was happening to her as her stroke was taking place. And she had a dramatic experience of the left brain and its extraordinary capacity to discriminate and, and see differences and be logical and be linear, and the right brain that is able to connect things and see how we are energetically and emotionally connected to all of life. And so mindfulness is inviting us to step into this right brain Certainly we need the left brain in life to function, but to move into that non-discriminating, non-judgmental way of perceiving with our attention. And then to go back into life after mindfulness, after meditation, and be more creative and flourish in our lives more fully. Here's a couple of definitions of meditation. And as we'll see later, one of the problems in meditation research is that different experimenters define the word differently. So it's hard, it's hard to really draw conclusions about what we know scientifically about meditation because everybody's not playing ball you know, from the same playbook. One definition of meditation, a self-directed practice for relaxing the body and calming the mind. Okay, one offering. Here's another. Meditation has two essential components, either or both of which can be experienced in a meditation session. Number one is concentrating. Concentration is focusing the mind on a particular value in a constant manner with extreme intent. I kind of like that phrase. How often in our lives do we have enough passion to say, I've got extreme intent about what I'm doing in this moment? Focusing attention on something that is of value to you. Contemplation is the direct experience of a transcendent consciousness in which the familiar boundaries of self and time and space are suspended, okay, going beyond our normal linear way of perceiving life in a contemplative experience as it's often described. Now, in the handout, there, hopefully everybody's got one now, that was produced at NIH. This is an excerpting from a primer to meditation that the Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine has produced 
I'd like for us to look just at a few paragraphs. I'm not going to read this out loud all the way through, but let's look at the first paragraph. Meditation is a mind-body practice in complementary and alternative medicine. And that's sort of the theme for our center's day, from noon right on through till 9 o'clock tonight. Mind-body practice in a view of health care and medicine that is complementary, that isn't just looking for alternatives, but is looking for the way in which mainstream health care can be augmented and supplemented by non-traditional methodologies. There are many types of meditation, most of which originate in ancient religious and spiritual traditions. Generally, a person who is meditating uses certain techniques, such as a specific posture, focused attention, an open attitude towards distractions. We're going to practice a little bit around techniques here in this hour. Meditation may be practiced for many reasons, such as to increase calmness and physical relaxation, to improve psychological balance, to cope with illness, to enhance overall well-being. Now, if we skip down to the four elements that are most common to meditation, that's about 70% of the way down the handout. A quiet location. So what was I telling you? I couldn't find a quiet place in my dorm when I was, up, when I was 18 years old. That was my first big obstacle. Meditation is usually practiced in a quiet place with as few distractions as possible. This can be particularly helpful for beginners. But I would invite you not to limit yourself to seeing meditation as only something you can do when your surroundings are 100% quiet. Can you bring mindfulness to the way you wash the dishes? Can you bring mindfulness to a walk across campus? There are things that we can do that are meditative, even when this first criterion isn't necessarily easily met. Second, a specific comfortable posture. Depending on the type being practiced, meditation can be done while sitting, lying down, standing, walking, or in other positions. Number three, focus of attention. Focusing one's attention is usually a part of meditation. For example, the meditator may focus on a mantra, a set of chosen words. It could be on an object, it could be on a sensation, or even the breath. Some sorts of meditation involve paying attention to whatever is the dominant content of consciousness, just sort of whatever's coming up. And then finally, an open, non-judgmental attitude. I already mentioned that one earlier. Now, if we look at the bottom of the page, the use of meditation for health in the United States, particularly around both practice and research. Meditation is used for overall wellness and various health problems such as, you flip the page over, anxiety, pain, depression, stress, insomnia, physical or emotional symptoms that may be associated with chronic illness, heart disease, HIV, AIDS, cancer, and their treatment. So it's got quite a tapestry in which it's being played out. So how widespread is the practice of meditation? A survey done in 2002 found that 62% of Americans said they had used some form of complementary or alternative medicine, and 52% said they had at least tried some type of mind-body technique such as meditation or progressive muscle relaxation or some way of going inward with their attention. More than 50% of the population of the United States, even in 2002. Now, I'd like to take you through a very simple kind of meditation experience. And this is what I call the three-minute meditator. And I have often encouraged people in workshop classes that I do around meditation to make a commitment to even three minutes a day of this kind of practice. It doesn't have to be focused on any kind of religious or spiritual orientation. It can be done just for its health promotion. Or if you want, there's a way of taking this into something that fosters your own personal, spiritual, or even religious growth. So it has a flexibility in that regard. And the three parts are breath attention, especially for relaxation and preparation. The focus of attention on something. And I'll talk about what that something could be. And then a final minute of intentionality that is focused outward. And the reason I think that last minute is important is that this caricature of meditation as people just contemplating their own navel and sort of uh, practicing meditation just for selfish ends, I think is something we have to guard against. 
It seems to me that a contemplative practice of any sort ought to make us more creative, more functional as parents, as teachers, as students, as citizens, and that we need to end the meditation period in a way that reminds us of our place in society. And so I often invite people at the end of a meditation session, even while their eyes are still closed, to turn with a kind of intentionality towards people or situations and just with a blessing or just with an inward statement of intentionality for the future, how they're going to take what they derive from meditation out into their daily life. How's that going to, in a sense, usher you out into the world in which you live in a more productive way? So if you can kind of put your papers aside for a moment, either on your lap or on the floor. And I brought with me a little pink shawl bell that my wife and I got uh, in Nepal a year and a half ago when we were in Kathmandu to visit a little Tibetan shop. And the sound of the bell, I think, can be an external representation of an inner place of one-pointedness and clarity. Now, there's no magic power in the bell or any other aid for attunement. But this can be an external representation of something that we can find in our own consciousness, of one-pointedness and clarity. And so as I ring the bell, that's to take us into just a minute of attention to our breathing. This is fundamentally the first step in Buddhist meditation practice. You don't have to be a Buddhist to use this method. But the Buddha taught just observe the flowing in of your breath and know you're breathing in, and just observe the flowing out of your breath and know you're breathing out. Now, with our linear, logical minds, we're very quick to make this a much more complicated exercise than it needs to be. And we can find ourselves sort of analyzing and judging, oh, that was a good breath, or, that one wasn't so good, or I wonder if the person next to me has to breathe so loud, and all the different ways that we can analyze what's going on. But well, what happens if you just relax into breathing? Or as the Zen Buddhist, or I'm sorry, the, the Vietnamese Zen meditation teacher Thich Nhat Hanh describes, can you just enjoy your breathing? Can you just relax and enjoy your breathing, even for one minute? Just breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. And then, for the next one minute, I'm going to suggest that we have a focal point. And rather than pick something that has some type of intellectual or spiritual content to it, we'll use the focal point that Herbert Benson used in his research at Boston around the relaxation response, as he calls it. And we'll just use the word one. And to let your mind just focus for a minute on that word one, perhaps repeating it silently in your mind, slowly. If your mind drifts off and you wonder, you know, are we really going to stop at 4.15? Or should I go to the Knowledge Cafe at 4.30? Or when am I going to get dinner and do all the things that are happening in today's program? And all the things that your mind can wander off to, just bring it back to one. 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 And that'll be our focal point for attention for a minute. And then the last minute, I'm going to invite you, in whatever way is meaningful to you, maybe it's a visualization, Maybe it's something you would call prayer. Maybe it's just holding a clear intentionality to consider a few people in your life for, you, for whom you have loving concern. And in some way, share the connection you felt in the silence with them as a statement of intending to bring meditation and mindfulness out into the world and the way you live your life. Okay, the three minute meditation. So, closing our eyes and we'll let the <coughs> bell sort of be the marker for us from each minute to the next. Just observing the flowing in and flowing out of breath. And just enjoy your breathing and relax into it.
attention to simply the word one. One. And then turning your thoughts and attention to a series of people or situations for which you have concern. You just feel your full-hearted intentionality as you reach out with your thoughts. Slowly let your attention come back. So, I ask you rhetorically, because there's not really time to do a full sharing, but what happened for you in, in those three minutes? What should we expect in the way of results for meditation? You know, a lot of times, it's sort of nothing. A lot of times there's no bells or whistles or tinglings of energy or feeling like you're floating or you know, moving into some other dimension. You just kind of, they are kind of hanging in there doing the best you can with your mindfulness practice. Are any of you who are practitioners of meditation willing to attest to the fact that that's often what happens? Yeah, and that's okay. In fact, sometimes there can be seemingly not much happening and yet it may well be that changes are slowly being affected. I went to a meditation class one time, and when it was over, there were people standing in line to come up and talk to the teacher. And I thought, well, I want to go up and say something to him. And I was in line right behind a couple, who when they got up to him, the man said, and I was sort of over-listening, said, I've been meditating for 10 years, and nothing has ever happened. What's going on here? And the meditation teacher said, well, do you feel like you're a different person than you were 10 years ago? And before he could answer, his wife said, he's a totally different man. And I can't say that he's changed anything in his life except that he's a meditator. Now, it may be that beneath the surface, slowly some of these habit patterns of reactivity or even health conditions are being altered. And it's like, you know, the dripping water that slowly erodes the rock and carves out something like the Grand Canyon. I also had a meditation teacher many years ago who said, sometimes I don't know when I listen to my students what is a good meditation experience and what's a not so good meditation experience. Because I've had students tell me fabulous, extraordinary, phenomenal things that happened to them during a meditation session, and then for years afterwards, all they can do, every time they sit down to meditate, is try to recreate what happened to them once before. And they're no longer dwelling in the present moment. They are so compulsive about trying to have that happen again. So it's very subtle. We can get caught up in the phenomenology of the whole thing and forget that the practice is just about being in the present moment, attentively, with purpose, and non-judgmentally. Now, what does science know about the effects of meditation or mindfulness practice? We're going to do a little quick Cook's tour around the literature. First of all, here's one statement that expresses the breadth 
around which meditation research has been done. Regular meditation can reduce health care use. It can increase longevity and quality of life, reduce chronic pain, reduce anxiety, reduce blood pressure, reduce serocholesterol level, reduce substance abuse, increase intelligence-related measures. Okay, students, trying to get your grade point averages up. Listen to that. Reduce post-traumatic stress syndrome in Vietnam vets. Lower blood um, cortisol levels, initially brought on by stress, and so on. How might those things happen? If we turn back to the colored page again, on the flip side, page two, again, this is from uh, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Health. This is their basic handout about meditation. Look right in the middle of the page where it talks about two elements of the autonomic nervous system. Their speculation is that the sympathetic nervous system helps mobilize the body for action. Well, that's not speculating, that's medical science. When a person is under stress, it produces the fight or flight response. The heart rate and the breathing go up and the blood vessels narrow, restricting blood flow. Medical science also knows that the parasympathetic nervous system causes the heart rate and breathing to slow down the blood vessels to dilate, improving blood flow, and digestive juices to increase. Then they go on to speculate that a lot of the research seems to be pointing to the possibility that meditation and mindfulness can help reduce the activities of the sympathetic nervous system and increase the activities of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, I would suggest to you that part of the problem has been that there's so many different things going on under the name of meditation and they're not the same technique. And it really makes it hard to sort out what it is that's effective about some of these practices. So for example, we have mantra-based meditation methods. We just did a simple example of that with the mantra one. And Herbert Benson, who had been part of the original research in the, in the early 1970s with transcendental meditation, he and Keith Wallace published things even in Scientific American about the physiological benefits of meditation, decided that he wanted to go back and replicate the research not using secret Sanskrit mantras that the practitioners had learned in TM, but instead something neutral in English, like the word one, and basically got the same results. But TM, or derivations of that, such as the relaxation response, would be one example of a meditative technique. Another method is progressive muscle relaxation. I'm going to do a little experience with you on that in just a minute. And it's much more of a kind of body scan and body awareness and just bringing mindfulness to your experience of your physical body and the way in which you can induce tension and then relax it and then drop more deeply into a relaxed physiological state. And so some of the research that's called meditation-based research is just using that kind of progressive relaxation technique. Other research, especially that being done at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, is mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's based largely on Vipassana, a, a Buddhist meditation technique that focuses especially on breath attention. So let's do another experience, okay? Then we're gonna look at some of the research results. So again, I want you to get relaxed. Just kind of put your papers aside. And this is one example of the way in which progressive muscle relaxation could be done. We're going to do a somewhat abbreviated version of it in that we won't spend as long with each part of the body as you might want to do if you were at home and really you know, had 20 minutes or so to go through this. So let's begin as we did before, with eyes closed and just let your attention come back to your breathing, simply as a way of becoming one-pointed with your intention, your intention. And we want to drop into a fuller experience of ourselves and our physical bodies. We pretty much move throughout the day taking our bodies for granted. Maybe every once in a while we get hungry or we have a pain in our neck or our back or get a little bit of a headache or something. But for the most part, we don't pay attention to the physical body. So let's bring concentrated attention just now to the physical body 
beginning with your hands and forearms, and I want you to make a fist, and let the tension build up in your hands and forearms, and really contract those muscles, stronger, stronger, just hold that tension, and then let it go, just relax. And just breathe relaxation into your hands and into your forearms. And then move your attention to your upper arms and shoulders. And begin to tense your upper arms. In whatever way you can feel those muscles could become stronger and powerful and tense, a little stronger. Be with it. And then let it go. And just relax. And keep your attention right there with those muscles. Relaxing into that part of your body. And then move your attention to your forehead. And just wrinkle up your forehead. Do whatever you have to do with your scalp and your eyebrows and contracting the muscles across your forehead. A little tenser. Stay with it. And then just let it go and relax. Keeping your attention right there. Feel what happens as those muscles can relax. And just let go. And then bring your attention to your eyes and your nose and your cheeks and scrunch up your face. Tighter and tighter. Scrunching. Scrunching. Feel how powerful those muscles can be. Scrunching. Stay with it. And then just let it go. And relax your face. Maybe as you relax your face, showing your true face to the world around you. And now your jaw and your chin and the front of your neck, tense that up. Do whatever you need to do to make it. Front of your neck, jaw and chin tighter, tighter, and then let it go. And just relax. We carry so much stress in our jaw, even as we're sleeping. What happens is we let that part of the body just relax. And then the back of the neck, the upper shoulders. Maybe you need to even scrunch your shoulders up and really contract the back of the neck. This is the way we walk around through life a lot without realizing it tighter. And then let it go. Oh, yeah. Just relaxing into the neck. Being able to allow the blood flow and the nerves and the muscles to just be at peace. And then the upper part of your body, your chest and your upper back, and just scrunch up everything about the upper part of your body, tighter, tenser, the way we protect ourselves from the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune around us. You've got to protect yourself, but then let it go. Maybe you don't. Maybe you can just relax into life. Letting go and relaxing back, lungs, and the heart. And then moving down into the gut, the abdomen, the lower back, and the hip muscles, tightening them up. Again, protecting ourselves down in the gut. Tighter, tighter, tense. And then just let it go. Just let it go. Just relax the gut. Relax the hips. Relax your lower back. And then the upper legs. Thighs and hamstrings and knees. Tense them up. Pull them together tight. A little tighter. And then let it go. Relaxing the upper legs. And then the lower legs pointing the toes. Making those calves really work. The ankles really work. Even the feet pointing those toes tighter. You're like a ballet dancer on toes. And then let it go. Relax. Just drop it. And then finally, flexing the ankle, bringing the toes up towards the shin. Make those legs work. Tighter. And then drop the legs and relax. And now just feel your whole body and what can happen when you've selectively invited the muscles and nerves and blood flow to be at its optimum. 
And let's take just half a minute to breathe into this relaxed body. And then let your attention slowly begin to come back, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So, what's happening in the science of mindfulness? What's happening in the science of meditation research? You know, we could spend a week in just looking. I want to give you a couple of little highlights. Here are two studies that are currently featured on the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine's website. And they're just snapshots of some things going on. One is a study that they entitled on their website, Meditation May Increase Empathy. Okay, that's a big promise, isn't it? What we know from medical science is that when a person witnesses somebody else's emotional state, such as you watching somebody in pain, or somebody in elation and joy, there's a similar activity that happens in your own brain. And that can be measured with M fMRI, with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Now this is an expensive kind of research to do, but a group at the University of Wisconsin got two groups with 16 in each group. One group was made up of meditation experts, and the other was just lay people who wanted to learn to meditate, who were given some meditation training. And they were monitored both before and after the meditation training. And what was being monitored was the extent to which, with an fMRI, there was indication in, in their brain that they were having the emotional experience that a certain stimulus person was having. And so they were given as a stimulus the sound of a woman screaming in distress. They were given the sound of a baby laughing with joy. And they were given the more neutral sound of just a busy restaurant. And what they found from this research was that for both groups, the meditation training seemed to enhance the extent to which this empathetic response was indicated with the fMRI data. And that the expert meditators especially showed a deepening capacity for sympathetic response for negative sounds, the sound of the woman who was screaming. Now that leads to all other kinds of questions, doesn't it? Often what comes out of research is as many questions as there are answers. That's an example of the quality of research that's going on with very sophisticated instrumentation being used. Here's another one that the NIH site speaks about on its current posting. It has to do with whether meditation can help us process information in the brain more efficiently. Hey students, how many of you would like to have your brain work more efficiently as you're reading material, as you're trying to process lectures and so forth, okay? Hopefully everybody is raising their hand at least mentally. Well, there's some evidence that maybe meditation could help with this. And the way this is measured is what's called attentional blink. Because when pieces of information are given to the brain, very closely spaced, what we find is that the brain doesn't perceive the second piece of information because it's still processing the first. And it depends on how far apart the, the two stimuli are. And so a research group worked with 17 expert meditators and 23 novice meditators who wanted to learn to meditate, and they were given a test to see the extent to which the, this attentional blink was um, present for them. In other words, how close the data had to be before they didn't see the second one. Is this making sense? Okay. Because it takes a lot of brain resources for us to process something. If the second thing is too close, we're not even going to notice the second one. So they got a baseline on each person in both groups. And then there was a three-month month gap in which the expert meditators were going to a meditation retreat, I get this, where they were going to meditate between 10 and 12 hours a day during those three months. I'm sure that's what all you students want to do for your summer break this summer, right? And the other group of beginners were given a one-hour class in meditation, and then they were asked to practice meditation daily for 20 minutes. And they found when they came back and reinstituted the test after three months that both groups had improved 
and as we might expect, the group that was the expert meditators doing the intense training had even greater improvement in terms of seemingly less brain resources being exhausted through this, this attentional process. Now, it would be nice if all the research coming out of meditation was, you know, laudatory, and it was like sweetness and light, and we all ought to learn to meditate because it's going to make us perfect. But that's just not the case. And I need to share with you in, the, in the, the spirit of a balanced understanding of all this, that in 2005, uh, the U.S. Health and Services Department uh, commissioned a study to be done of all the meditation research that had been published between 1956 and 2005. And a very elaborate report was produced, and it's sort of mixed results. And I want to read to you a little bit from that report. They said that 813 studies were investigated, with half of those studies published after 1994. Overall, they said, we found that methodologically the quality of meditation research is poor, with significant threats to validity in every major category of quality measured, regardless of the study design. They did find that in the 311 studies that seemed to be most sound, there was a, the con most consistent and strongest physiological effects from meditation were in healthy populations where there was the reduction of heart rate, blood pressure, and cholesterol, and the strongest neuropsychological effect was increased verbal creativity. Now here's their conclusion. The field of meditation research and practices and their therapeutic application is beset with uncertainty. The therapeutic effects of meditation cannot be established based on the current literature. Whoa. I know I've been going around citing this, that, and the other as if it's sort of case closed. We already know meditation's great for all these things. And they're saying, not so fast. There's still lots of research that needs to be done. And what did they define as the biggest need? I've already given you a hint about this earlier. We've got to more carefully define what we're even talking about with meditation. Because all different ways in which the word is being used in research studies. We have to more carefully operationalize what we even mean by that discipline. So their firm conclusion, quote, on the effects of meditation practice and health care is that nothing can be drawn upon currently with any full support. Okay? Lots of work still to be done. Now, we're hoping to be a player in that with our center here because a significant part of our work with our center is funding research among Mason faculty, not just with meditation, certainly, but that's part of what we want to be working with, mindfulness practices, and how they can be impactful in a wide variety of different settings. Now, I'd like for us to try one more little meditation exercise in the 10 minutes we have left. And I would like to invite you to consider that maybe we can take the mantric approach a little bit deeper, where the focal point is more value-centered and not just something neutral. So when Dr. Benson, back in the 1970s, was doing his relaxation response re research, he purposefully chose a word that would be neutral. But as we saw, some of the definitions of meditation suggest that it's selectively directing attention on something that is value-driven. And particularly meditation practices that come out of ancient traditions, thousands of years old, that have a religious or a spiritual overtone, invariably have some kind of a value-driven content. So I'm going to invite you, just in the, the, the spirit of being a researcher with me here this afternoon, to pretend for a moment that a key value in your life is caring about other people and service. You want your life to in some way be benefiting the greater whole. And I suspect that's not a big stretch. I think the fact that you come to an event like this suggests that you have some sense of our, our collective well-being. So I'm guessing it's not a stretch to suggest that you have a value around service. And so I'm going to ask you, in our little experiment, for another short meditation, to work with me on a mantra that says, let me be a channel of blessings to others. Let me be a channel of blessings to others. And you wouldn't have to word it that way, but that's a starting point for us. 
And can you see how that little mantra, and mantra means mind tool, is uh, representational of that idea or that value of service? Now, what would it mean to meditate on that mantra? Do you just sit there and say the words over and over again and hope like they have some kind of magic power? That just keeps the mantra at an intellectual level. One person who was extremely influential for me in the early years of learning to meditate was a little old Tibetan monk named Lama Anagarika Govinda. He died in the mid-1980s. And I got to meet and talk with him a couple of times. And I went to a class as a guest for one afternoon that he was teaching at SMU at Perkins Theological Seminary. And he was asked about mantra-based meditation techniques. And he said, people in the West need to understand that there's no power in the mantra. It's like a magnifying glass. He said, if you go out and find a bushman in the Amazon jungle, and you're on a sunny day, and you take that magnifying glass and a dry leaf, and you hold it up so the leaf is in a certain relationship to the magnifying glass, what's going to happen? The leaf's going to catch on fire, right? And the bushman might think there's some kind of magic power in the magnifying glass not realizing that all the magnifying glass does is to focus the, the rays of the sun, the energy that's there. So he said in the same way, Westerners have misunderstood and thought there was some kind of magic power in certain mantra. But instead, they just focus energy. You need to understand the meaning of the words. So he said, imagine we took that same bushman out of the jungle and we asked him to do an experiment. And we said, we want you to say over and over again, twice a day for 20 minutes, the mantra E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared. And we're going to come back in six months. Please do this, twice a day for 20 minutes. So let's suppose this Bushman is very compliant, come back, sure enough, he's done it every day. And Govinda said, how reasonable would it be to expect that that Bushman will now understand Einstein's special theory of relativity? Not very realistic expectation, is it? Because he doesn't know that that's just a distillation of a greater teaching, and that E stands for energy, and M stands for mass, and C stands for the speed of light. And he said in a similar way, Westerners that take these mantra that are distillations of profound teachings, and expect they're going to become enlightened just by saying those words, that's about how sophisticated they are in their thinking. So he said, instead, take something that is value-driven for you, that can be distilled into a few words, and the way you use the words is to evoke the feeling that they have for you. So when you do something for somebody else and don't expect anything back, how does that make you feel? There's a certain feeling to that, isn't there, of altruism? You do something for somebody else, you don't expect anything back, there's a feeling that goes with that. That's the feeling we'd hope to evoke saying the mantra, let me be a channel of blessings to others. So as you say the words a few times, you begin to get in touch with that feeling, and then you let go of the words. And you just hold in silent attention that feeling. Now how long can you hold that feeling before your mind drifts off to, has he ever going to finish this talk in three minutes, or I'm getting hungry, or all these distractions that can come up. When you notice you've drifted away, that's when you come back to the words, until they evoke the feeling again, and then you just hold in silent attention that feeling. That's a practice of mantric-based meditation. You ready to try it with me for just a little short meditation time as an experiment? Okay. So we'll use the bell one more time to take us into the quiet. Maybe at first, just for half a minute, let your attention be on your breathing. And feel what it's like just to relax into your breathing. Meditation is not an effort. We don't need to try to become expert meditators. We don't have to try hard to be good at meditation. It's just relaxing into something that is natural for the mind and brain. We're built for relaxation. Both with one hemisphere of our brain as well as the parasympathetic nervous system, we're relaxing into something natural. 
And then for just one minute, hold in silent attention the feeling evoked by the words, let me be a channel of blessings to others. Let me be a channel of blessings to others. be a channel of blessings to others. slowly coming back. <coughs> so I would invite you to take mindfulness into the rest of the day. <coughs> <coughs> 